The Great Barrier Reef is the largest living structure on Earth, spanning 348,000 square kilometres. Its diversity and abundance of life is unmatched. During the summer of 2016, the Great Barrier Reef experienced the single largest coral bleaching event ever, with the northern section most severely affected. Unprecedented and back-to-back, -back, large scale coral bleaching happened again in 2017, this time devastating reefs further south. But it wasn't just the Great Barrier Reef that was affected, this happened to coral reefs worldwide. Right before our eyes, we were losing our coral reefs, the ocean's most diverse and breathtakingly beautiful environment, a $56 billion Australian tourism industry, and a living global icon. Something had to be done. While it was understood from aerial surveys that much of the northern Great Barrier Reef had suffered from coral bleaching, what wasn't known was the extent of the damage underwater. With just one dedicated research vessel for the entire Great Barrier Reef, and with limited funding, scientists simply could not access the remote northern reaches. But the data from this region was of global significance as it would reveal information about the future health of the Great Barrier Reef and coral reefs worldwide as bleaching continues. You see, coral bleaching is just one part of the story and it's all related to warmer than normal water temperatures. When the coral is bleached, it is still alive, yet severely stressed. If water temperatures fall back to normal, the coral can recover. When the water stays too warm for too long, the result is death. When this happens on a large scale, entire ecosystems are impacted as the corals are the living building blocks of a reef, much like the structures in a city. And without them, coral reefs as we know them will disappear. Once they are gone, they are gone forever. One person understands this better than most. My name is John Rumney, and for the last 42 years I have lived and breathed the Great Barrier Reef. It is every part of me, and I love it as if it were family. After this year's bleaching event, I just had to check in on an old friend. They call it the monolith, and it's the largest single coral colony I have ever seen anywhere on Earth. It is estimated to be between one and 2,000 years old, extends 25 meters in depth, and is about 12 meters wide. What I saw shocked me. It has never looked like this before. The monolith was actually glowing. Right before my eyes, this living structure was suffering. Trapped on the reef, it had happily called home for so many centuries, and now was slowly dying in the warmer than normal waters that had until this moment nourished it with everything that it needed since it was a single coral polyp, the size of a pinhead. In the last six months, I have seen the Great Barrier Reef undergo its toughest challenge yet, as coral bleaching has taken its toll on corals mostly in the north where I am now. But this is different. It really hit me. See the monolith, the oldest coral colony I know, its existence now hanging in the balance. Make no mistake, what we are seeing here is a global warning. In a single breath, I understand now 
that I have to act, that we all have to act, to save the Great Barrier Reef and reefs worldwide from ourselves. I am 66 years old. After more than a thousand years, I honestly wonder now if the monolith can outlast me. I'll check back with you soon, old friend. Along with marine scientist and media expert, Dr. Dean Miller, they had a plan. Built on over 20 years experience of funding, coordinating and carrying out more than 700 reef expeditions between them, Great Barrier Reef Legacy was created. The mission was simple, to crew and operate the only independent research vessel on the Great Barrier Reef. This would provide free and essential access for the best scientific minds and innovators, the most effective communicators and multimedia specialists to build a platform for research, education and change. This was Science for Solutions. But they were not alone. Backed by a team of researchers, divers, tourism operators, media experts, teachers, and extremely dedicated volunteers. They created a collaborative movement that instantly gained national and international attention. Core to their model was aligning like-minded organisations for the common goal of saving the reef, and long-time partners, the Climate Council, worked closely with Great Barrier Reef Legacy to bring necessary attention to the issue. You know, one of the big problems that the reef has is access by researchers and by others to a global audience about what's actually happening. Because the reef's underwater, we can't see it day to day. We can't see the changes in it. Legacy will give us a platform to really start explaining to the world what's at stake with our changing climate. And on top of all of this, Great Barrier Reef Legacy had the support of the community. Because together we know there are no barriers too great to save our reefs. With all this goodwill, momentum, determination, and a critical need to establish what had happened to the corals in the northernmost pristine part of the reef, Great Barrier Reef Legacy launched its first research expedition in November 2017. Funded by the Northern Escape Collection and the offer of their vessel, by small business donations from far and wide, and by in-kind support from companies all over the globe, Great Barrier Reef Legacy was able to provide free access to a team of collaborating researchers from private and government research institutions and to continue to build networks and relationships with existing organisations. As now, more than ever before, it was time to work together. With expert scientists arriving, the media soon followed and a team of volunteer crew from Great Barrier Reef Legacy joined the Flying Fish in Port Douglas to turn a luxury white boat into a dedicated research vessel. In support and solidarity, the multi-award winning Netflix documentary, Chasing Coral, sent their star, Zach Rago, to be part of the education and communication team. Together, they launched the largest privately funded collaborative research expedition the Great Barrier Reef had seen, with results communicated direct from the reef to the public through live television and radio interviews and daily interactive updates on social media channels with a combined reach of more than 5 million followers. And all of this was achieved by volunteers. Over the next 21 days, we're sending our research vessel and a team of expert marine scientists into the very remote, far northern Great Barrier Reef on an expedition to provide an overall reef health assessment and to search for the super corals. With just three short weeks to undertake the extensive scientific education and media program, the team, led by John and Dean, got to work. The main objective was to determine where 
how and why coral survived. Understanding this in the most hard hit section of the Great Barrier Reef would give an insight into what the future holds for corals and what we can do to help. Nobody quite knew exactly what they would find as this was the first team to extensively carry out in-water research activities in this 1,000 kilometre stretch since 2014, two years prior to the bleaching events. I've joined this expedition after leading the Australian Student Marine Sciences bleaching response for the last two years in 2016 and 2017 and really interested and excited to get the chance to come up into the far north and really get under the water and see what the outcomes of those major bleaching events have been for the far north of the Great Barrier Reef. But for us um, at, at an institute that doesn't have a research vessel, you know, trying to get up to the less accessible north is a challenge. You know, there are opportunities, but they're often costly um, and you know, not as frequent. So having sort of a trip like this where you know, we've got the opportunity to go, it's, it, you know, for us so far it's been a once in a lifetime you know, opportunity and hopefully you know, isn't it going to be a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's very hard to access the far north, especially uh, so many days, so many reefs. And this expedition is the ultimate solution uh, for that. Through this unique and collaborative model, the different research teams were able to work alongside each other, on the same reef, on the same day, to solve their own piece of the puzzle and complement each other's findings. A new and revolutionary approach to understanding the coral bleaching phenomenon. While the divers slipped beneath the waves, Dr. Javier Leon took to the air. So basically what I'm doing is just getting this little drone to, to go to a reef flat and take overlapping photos. Uh, from that overlap, I can, I can build these amazing ortho mosaics. Um, we're getting two centimeters, which is just unreal. We can just zoom in so, so much that it's just amazing that the stuff we can see. Ideally, this is setting a baseline that we can come back and see because the, the detail that this is giving us um, will allow us to see things like major bleaching events, for example, so we can definitely see how white or not the reef that is. Drone mapping for the first time tells us so much about the health of reefs on a grand scale. But it was up to Dr. Monique Grohl and Dr. Manuel Gonzalez Rivero to take the mapping and surveys underwater to understand bleaching at a much finer resolution. We take a camera, we, we take um, about an image every meter or every two meters, and those images are referenced because we have a GPS on the top of the buoy. Then we manage to actually put them together. So every single image has uh, information where we were, it was taken. And then trying to relate that to the satellite images and trying to model the, the entire reef system as in to trying to identify the different bits for the entire reef. On average we swim about three kilometers a day and we take about on average five to six thousand pictures during those three kilometers. We have maps for every single road, forest, part of the country, but there is not one map of the reef. Turtles have also shown changes in behaviour with warmer water, and Dr Ian Bell was on board to learn more about the far northern green turtle populations. So you can see how she's using her hind flippers, how dexterous she is to actually dig her egg chamber, and then she's going to lay her eggs, and you can see the eggs now um, popping out from uh, her overduck. And now that she's finished laying her eggs, we're going to um, put this satellite tracker on her and, uh, and then uh, we're gonna try and track her progress from here, from the nesting beach, through the migration pathways back to the feeding grounds. Over the course of the expedition, the teams visited a range of highly impacted reefs, devastated by the bleaching events. Among all this mortality, Dr. Neil Canton and Great Barrier Reef Legacy interns identified the first known super coral species. Acropora tenuous, a tough branching coral. Obvious signs of bleaching mortality within the lagoon, lots of dead coral. 
but it took a long time to find enough that had eggs. But we've found six whole colonies here that have eggs that we're now going to try to understand if these eggs are viable. So these are survivors of the last two bleaching events, and we want to understand what these guys have that the others didn't. Uh, back to the ship, keep them on flowing water for the next few days before we try to fly them home. Uh, back to Townsville in the National Sea Simulator at Ames, uh, where we're going to test if these corals from the far north that have survived the bleaching events can provide um, increased tolerance to future thermal stress and ocean warming and help us enhance reef restoration efforts into the future. Dr. Emma Camp and Assistant Sam Goyen took the investigation to a completely different level molecular and physiological. So on the dives we are looking for our target coral species to see what their physiological traits are and also their genetic traits to try and understand how they've survived some of the worst bleaching events the Great Barrier Reef has seen. So we select these uh, individuals to bring back on board the boat. In the bar from here <laughs> you can see our little makeshift lab. And what we've done is we've got two different coral species, but two that have been abundant so far on the transects we've got. And what we wanted to see is are there specific traits or properties of these corals that maybe have allowed them to survive the bleaching and do, and do better um, over the course of the stress that we've seen. Their work determines just how super corals can survive and is fundamental to predicting coral health to inform intervention programs. But it's the outer reef sites that surprised the team. More regularly flushed with cooler, deep oceanic water, they seem to have survived much better than the inshore and mid-shelf reefs. Yet there still were signs of bleaching and mortality. One particular site, though, revealed something very, very special. And the grandfather of coral, Dr. Charlie Verran, responsible for classifying and naming more than 20% of the world's corals, was stunned. Oh, it's an amazing place. <laughs> I've never seen this on the Great Barrier Reef. Really? No, really. Never, ever? Never. Ever. Wow, what does that say to you? It says, boy, this, this place is not done yet, that's for sure. <laughs> My God. Well, that's good news. That's good news. Oh, it's just... We've seen an area which has got more species of cropper, that's the staghorn corals, than any place I've ever seen on the Great Barrier Reef. It was really incredibly unexpected and uh, it's the richest site of a cropper ever found on the Great Barrier Reef. And then on top of that we've found corals that have never been recorded on the Great Barrier Reef and then we found at least one uh, really outstanding new species. Why is this one just so well, special, Charlie? Well, it's just, I've just never seen it before. It's just something completely new to me. And I've never seen anything like it. And there were, as far as I know, as anybody else. Was there lots of it down there? No, there wasn't. That was the only colony I saw. So what I'm holding here is a tray full of absolute discovery. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if anything in your tray has been recorded in the Great Barrier Reef before. Wow. Awesome. Well, this could be the most significant collection of corals uh, for the Great Barrier Reef in a very, very long time. As the team headed back to Port Douglas after this incredible journey, they began to compile preliminary results, images and videos to be made available for free in an open access database, the first of its kind. For it's not just collaboration on board that had taken place, as this information will continue to be shared with scientists, managers, innovators, educators, communicators, non-government organisations and the public worldwide. I've never come across such a big collaboration. Uh, people are willing to share their data, which is, you know, we're working with five or six different organisations and that's really rare. I can see now, not, not even being a scientific person, the benefit of having these numbers or having this, this cross-representation of all the disciplines of that one science. And, and their knowledge, I mean, the knowledge is bloody fantastic. I can't believe it, really, what these guys bring in. 
and uh, yeah, it's very impressed. I guess the other thing is that not all of the Northern Barrier Reef is dead, and I think that that's a really important, you know, point to make. We're at a critical point now, um, where we have reef left. We've got time, and we've got the opportunity to conserve that. But we need to act now to make that happen. And this trip's sort of given us hope um, that there is something there to save, and we need to we need to act. And so the Great Barrier Reef Legacy Model is really this new version of science. We are actively going out, doing the same thing that a researcher would do on a normal vessel, get the data, get the numbers, crunch them, produce it, and then share it with the science. And instead what we have the opportunity here is let's share that with the world in a meaningful, powerful way, whether it's through social media, multimedia, all these amazing assets that the real world works in nowadays. People get their information at very short intention spans. If you can produce the right stuff, from the scientists that's impactful, educational, and get it out there, then that's how Great Barrier Reef Legacy is going to instigate change. The Great Barrier Reef is the world's largest ecosystem on the planet. And it is a very challenging ecosystem to really comprehensively study if you only have one or two ships running. Um, and if we're able to add to that fleet with, with other options to spend more time in the field and to get to more reefs, and to be part of the Great Barrier Reef legacy into the future, if we didn't have that additional opportunity, we'll certainly limit um, what we know about how the Great Barrier Reef is responding to such major impact. Well, it is Australia's icon as far as the natural world is concerned. It's the world's icon as far as marine life is concerned. So it's incredibly important. And uh, this trip has, has really provided, uh, I hope the first of many handles on, on how we can get the reef through the coming decades. It's going to need all the help it can get, and this will be the strongest helping hand I've seen yet. The detailed results of this unique expedition are still being collated, and the information collected is of great significance to understand how the natural system can cope with heat stress events, and more importantly, what we can do to help. What we do know, however, is it's not too late, but we must act now. The Great Barrier Reef does not belong to me or to you. It belongs to us all, and each one of us has a role to play in its survival. The Great Barrier Reef Legacy Model is a long-term solution to improving reef health education and innovation by providing the most cost-effective access to the reef for those who need it most. By supporting Great Barrier Reef Legacy, you are in effect supporting hundreds of other projects. By acting as a platform and a catalyst that allows us to all work together, we can take immediate action and leave a legacy of hope and resilience for the next generation. Together, there are no barriers too great to save our reefs.